Hi, welcome to the signal pad. What we have here is an HP 8515A, part of the really famous network analyzer sets that HP used to make. This is an S parameter test set from 40 megahertz to 26 and a half gigahertz. And I bought this for a couple of hundred dollars from eBay, not really for the purposes of fixing it because I don't have the rest of this equipment anyway and these are fairly old even though they are actually in use in a lot of places still. But rather I wanted to take it apart and take some equipment and components out of it. See if it's worth salvaging for parts. There are a lot of RF components in here which are of course, you know, they don't change. These are amplifiers, splitters and cables and so on and connectors which we may be able to use for all of our other experiments. So this is really a study to find out if it's worth salvaging anything from things like this. And we may even do some measurements on the components we salvage depending on what we find. So let's get started. All right, let's take this apart. I already took one screw at the back. It's supposed to slide just off. It definitely intended to be serviceable. There we go. And let's take a look. Wow, look at that. That is beautiful. Lots of components in there that we can salvage. Now, before we take anything out of this, of course, we need to understand how it works at least a little bit so we can identify the components that are here. Sometimes people leave comments on the channel that the channel has become too advanced and it's sometimes difficult to follow. I apologize for that. I'll try to do something about it. And of course, as we do more and more, we tend to get more advanced. I have to keep that in mind. So let's think about what we're trying to do here. Well, this is an S parameter headset, which means that it's supposed to provide the signals into a device under test, as well as look at the signals coming from the device under test. In order to measure a full two port S parameter, you need to measure four things, two incident waves, on port one and port two. Those are the signals entering the device under test and two reflected waves coming back. One would be here and one would be here. Now these reflected waves are useful because it represents a signal going, bouncing against the device under test and coming back. But it also represents a signal that's entering from the other side going through the device under test, which means that you can measure four distinct things, which are the S11, S21, S12, and S22 by using those four A1, A2, B1, and B2 parameters. So right off the bat, from a global point of view, this instrument is supposed to be able to down convert four RF signals individually and use some calibration coefficients and some mathematics to derive the S parameters from that. So from based on that simple knowledge of how S parameters actually work, we should be able to identify all the components that are here. So here is a port one, here's a port two, and this massive rectangular piece must be the coupler. It's much larger than I anticipated, given that it doesn't really go down to very low frequency. It only goes down to 40 megahertz. I'm not sure, sure why it is so large. It's probably very low loss. This itself would be an interesting thing to measure the S parameters of using another network analyzer so we can understand how it works. But nonetheless, we can see we have a signal entering here, a signal entering here. Those would be the incident waves on port one and port two. And we have two signals coming back. These are the reflected signals. So there is four that I talked about earlier. So that's one useful component to take out, these couplers. Then I see one bias D over here and one bias D over here. A bias D separates the DC and the AC signal in an RF component, meaning that you can apply a DC voltage, it goes through a separate path, and an RF signal, which goes through a different path. In this case, the RF enters the bias D over here and then shows up on the other side. Ideally, there is no loss through it, but of course there is going to be some loss. But there is also a DC connection at the top. It means that it's able to inject the DC voltage, which also appears over here. So the DC and the AC add up here, whereas the AC is only present on one side. These biases are quite expensive, and these are probably 26 and a half gigahertz rated. They could be 50 gigahertz rated also if you're lucky. And since they've never been connected or disconnected, they've always been here, they're essentially brand new and quite valuable. So those are definitely worth taking out. Now in the middle, we see two attenuators. Now why would you need an attenuator in a system like this? Well, think about what you're measuring. Let's imagine that you're measuring an amplifier. So you would put your amplifier in between port one and port two. A signal would be injected into the amplifier, would be amplified, and then will come back over here. So in that case, the signal flow is through here, going over, bouncing through here, and coming there. So if your amplifier has, let's say, 40 dB of gain, you're not going to put 0 dBm into the amplifier, because in that case, the amplifier would have to produce 40 dBm of power if you were to operate linearly. Of course, it usually cannot. That would mean that the amplifier will compress. And the S parameters you would measure in that situation would be gibberish. It would not represent the small signal S parameters, which means that the power you want to put into the amplifier would have to be backed off by a large margin to ensure that the amplifier is linear. That's exactly what these attenuators are for. They are to control the incident power into the two ports independently. And that's what they are used here, and these would be quite useful to extract too. They're probably 26 and a half gigahertz rated, and we can control them using some external circuitry. I think the control circuitry over here. 
So these probably have switched many times over their lifetime, depending on how often this has been used uh, versus attenuation. It's actually not that common to keep changing the attenuation, so these are probably in fairly good shape. So that takes care of the main components on the signals that we see going to the RF ports. And then there's a component over here, and that component is actually a switch, a solid state switch, and a distribution amplifier. So why would you need that? Well, there is one RF port in the back of this unit. That RF signal comes from a different part of the 8510 network analyzer. That's the RF signal you want to actually put here and here. By putting it into this distribution amplifier and a switch, you can amplify it to the necessary value and then switch it either to this side or to this side or to all the different mixers that are here. So we'll talk about that too. And that means that you need a, a solid state amplifier switch. This is pretty useful. Might be a little bit difficult to control, but we can figure out how it is. Actually, I don't really see much connected to it, which is interesting itself. We'll take a look at that separately. There's two additional connections in the back. That's why there are so many cables here. That's because this particular thing is equipped with what's called a port extension, which allows you to, as the name suggests, extend the ports by introducing delays into the appropriate places. There's a coil of cable here and a coil of cable there. And those are connected to the port extensions. Normally, you just loop them around, so then they don't do anything. So those cables are not really that useful. These are rigid cables and made particularly for this instrument. But this distribution amplifier is going to come out. I also see some attenuators here, some attenuators here. Those are always useful. We're going to take that too. Well, what else do we need besides that? Well, we take care of the RF. We see the couplers and the attenuators and the biases. We still need to create a signal to down convert the incident wave into an IF frequency, which we can then digitize. That digitization is done again outside of this box in the 8510 controller. Uh, so in that case, we will need down convert mixers. We would need something to control a certain VCO or a, a voltage tune oscillator in order to down convert that using what, the, what in this case are samplers. So if you look in the middle, we actually have a v voltage tuned oscillator here going into a four-way splitter, which I think is equipped with a step recovery diode to generate the pulses necessary to down convert these two signals and these two signals. So there's four identical sections here in this little star configuration. And these are the down converters, of course, and the samplers. And there's a global loop that is controlling everything together. The actual voltage to tune this oscillator is coming from the outside of this instrument, from the back over here, allowing you to down convert that into an IF frequency. So therefore, there is an IF down conversion, a bandpass filter, an amplifier, and everything else necessary. So this block in the middle with the step recovery diode and the voltage tune oscillator, yeah, it's kind of useful, but just more of a curiosity. It will be hard to use it for anything else. And there are some other IF control circuitry switches for the attenuator control, some other routing, some useful cables over here. And the IF signal from these four are coming from these orange cables, which are then all come over here, going to somewhere like this, and then eventually out of here. Or actually, wait, wait a second, no, they're directly going in the back. So that goes into the 8510. So yeah, lots of interesting things to take apart and a lot to learn from just by doing that. So I suggest we start uh, in a strategic way and take these uh, one at a time. I'm very curious to see the couplers. It's going to take a little bit of time to take everything out. All right, so let's take a look and see what we got out of this instrument. So there are a couple of PCBs here which control various components inside. They're okay, but they're not really that interesting for us to do anything with them. This particular one controls the switch, the solid state switches on the RF port. And we'll take a look at that component separately and the two attenuators. We can get some information from here. You can see that there is in total 90 dB of attenuation in four distinct steps. So it's an electrical mechanical attenuator with four distinct pads inside, giving you a 90 dB in total. We've even done repairs and teardowns of those in the past. And then the next board is the board that controls the voltage tuned oscillator. This has a few analog circuitry on it to sum the tuned voltage controller, which comes from outside of this unit, as well as a few other things that uh, move the frequency around. And we can put this aside too. And then finally, the main CPU processor, very simple. It has a Motorola processor and an EEPROM under This is what co talks to the GPIB and essentially kind of overlooks everything in the, in the instrument from a digital point of view. So let's put that aside too. And let's take a look at this block. So this block here is the actual RF switching. And we saw it when I started to take it apart. And you can see it has three control voltages here, here, and here on the cables. I kept them together with the cable. And this actually does not have an amplifier. I believe this is just a passive splitter. So the signal goes over here. It splits into multiple paths inside. And using what is most likely pin diode switches, you can then activate these with the appropriate drive voltages and then push the signal into any of those ports that you want. 
and this allows you to put the incident stimulus signal onto port 1 or port 2, as we talked about when we were looking at the overall structure. This is interesting and works up to 26.5 gigahertz, a solid state switch, so it is useful. So we're going to keep it for potentially using it in the future. Then we have the two step attenuators right over here. These two step attenuators are identical, 90 dB in total, 26.5 gigahertz with uh, typical drive voltages which are compatible with a lot of switch drivers that Keysight makes. I've done even teardowns and repairs of these uh, in various situations, mostly from spectrum analyzers. In network analyzers, these do not age very well, or very, I should say, very rapidly, because they are not switched very often. In a spectrum analyzer, they are switched all the time. But for this one, once you calibrate and once you decide what you want your incident power to be, you're basically standing steady. So these probably have still a lot of life in them, even though the instrument is quite old. So what keeping and taking a look at later. Then I have a whole bunch of attenuators, and these are interesting in their own right. So for instance, these are 60B attenuators. Uh, you can clearly see they're labeled in such a way to be sold in independently, individually, to 26.5 gigahertz. They work from DC to 26.5 because these are broadband attenuators made of resistors inside. And you can make them such that there's 50 ohm match on both sides, but there's a DC path as well. So you have to be careful depending on how you use these. There's four of these 60B attenuators. They're quite expensive and they're in very, very good shape because they're essentially brand new because they've never been screwed and unscrewed. You can see how clean the connectors are. And there is also a few unusual ones. These are 13 dB attenuators. 13 is a weird number, uh, but this is obviously custom made. Oh, wait, is this another 6 dB? Yeah, there's another 6 dB. So there's two 13 dB ones, so I'm going to keep those, of course, for a lot of our RF experiments uh, that we would use these. Now, as I mentioned, there's also BiSDs. So here's one of them. Now, there's actually two of these BiSDs, like so. And they're also completely brand new, as you can see. And they're not labeled. Uh, but they're obviously 26 and a half gigahertz parts. I mean, they're not labeled for um, being sold individually. And I know this because I have a lot of these from other sources. Here's another one from before. This is actually a 50 gigahertz one. You can clearly see the difference in the connectors if you look carefully. The two different connectors for the two different frequencies. You can see the air dielectric diameter being completely different between the two of them. That's the difference between the resonance frequency where the mode shifts for these connectors. So this one, if you go above 26 and a half gigahertz, it will not work very well. It will not be a good uh, connector in coax. So uh, this ha ha one of them has a male connector on one side, which is nice. Uh, these are two female connectors. And if you look, they've added additional low-pass filtering directly on the bias input, even some ferrite beads to remove any potential spikes or anything on that is essentially additional filtering. Now, making biases is, is not easy. Uh, here's another example. This is a broken one that I have. This is a really, really expensive one. This is an SHF, 123B, from 50 kilohertz to 65 gigahertz, which is an extraordinary range. These are very useful for optical applications or broadband as signals because you want to go as close to DC as, as possible. And here's where you apply the DC voltage. And you can see the very simplified block diagram on here that shows an inductor and a capacitor. This is deceptively simplified, of course, because these are all hybrid. If you were to put a very large inductor here, well, that's good because it takes you to very, very low frequencies and allows you to reduce this 50 kilohertz as low as possible. But at the same time, a very large lumped inductor would have a self-resonance frequency that happens much earlier. And there's no way this would work up to 65 gigahertz. So all of these are hybrid, meaning that you start with a small inductor and a bigger one and a bigger one and a bigger one with the appropriate detuning networks and even additional capacitors to tune out some of the things you don't want. It's a very complex structure, and that's why these are expensive. These are, as you can see, V connectors up to 67 gigahertz. Excellent quality. This one doesn't work. I'm not sure what's wrong with it. I've been waiting to fix it. It's just been sitting in my drawer. So we have two of these, BiSDs, which I'm quite happy about. So we're going to put those in our parts list as well. I kept the filters on them, but normally you, know, you would remove them from most things that you want to work with. And I also said that there was a whole bunch of cables, <laughs> which are all over here. Well, these are mostly useless because they are already bent into shape for a particular um, application, of course. The really nice thing about these when you design them originally and cut and shape them is that they don't move at all. So they are exactly what you want for a meteorology grade type of measurement, for an S-parameter measurement, but you don't want any phase deviation over time. So they are super rigid. But as a result, you can only use them in this exact shape. So you can see that the usefulness is limited. Here's the port extension. As I said, it's a coil to cause a delay. There's two of them, one port extension there, one port extension here. Again, not really that useful. Put that aside. 
And here are our couplers. Now, these are actually triax bridges. And look at the size of these things. And I have a feeling that these would have extraordinary directivity and very good performance. So I'm eager to measure them. This is one of the things we're going to measure with our S parameter set. I want to see the S parameter from here to here, which is the main, this is the main port. This is where you inject the RF signal. And here's the coupled port. So there should be a signal flowing this way. And there should be a signal flowing this way. And we want to measure the directivity. And the two port S parameters of, of, of them, they should be identical. So we can just measure one of those. Very excited to see the performance of these. You can see the size of this compared to a regular coupler and also compared to a resistive coupler, which I talked about in one of the other videos when we, when we repaired the network analyzer, where we saw by using a resistive coupler, you make something that's you know, in the area of only a few millimeters by a few millimeters. But of course, the performance of that the directivity isolation of that is not in the same universe as this one. So this gives you extremely good performance and preserves the dynamic range of the network analyzer at the cost of it being massive and, of course, expensive. And the last block is this one. Oh, this is our quad mixer. Now, I haven't taken this apart any further, but I do want to. Now, this is not something that's very easy to use on its own for a few reasons. I mean, you could use these mixers because the bias voltages are very clear where they come from, and the individual ports are very clear. Let me zoom in a little bit more. There we go. So you can clearly see the, uh, the voltages that you need to apply to it. The bias voltages and controls of the sampler and everything are here. And you can put in your LO input, which comes from in there. You can put your RF input, and then you get your IF out if everything is working correctly. I think we should open one of these and see what's inside. I'm very curious to see how it's made. And in the center, we have our VTO control. And at the bottom, we have the main sampler pulse generator. You can see it comes to the bottom, so you could, that's how you would dis disassemble it. We could also open this and see what's inside of it. I'm mostly really curious because you know these are custom uh, interfaces, and I don't think it's going to be that useful for anything else. But anyway, let me know in the comment section if you have managed to repurpose any of these. But nonetheless, we're going to take a look at one of them anyway. So first thing first, let's measure these guys. So let's measure the S parameter of this triax bridge and see how well it would perform in a network analyzer and see the properties it has. So here's the port 1 of this network analyzer in the background, and here's the port 2 of the network analyzer, and this coupled port is right now unterminated. And I have a termination here which we can just attach to it when we want to. So let's take a look and see if the S parameters makes any sense. And also, more importantly, what does the S parameter tell us about the behavior of this particular coupler? So let's see here, what do we have? So looking at port 1, you can see port 1 is really well matched. And looking at port 2, port 2 is not well matched. It's about minus 10. Now you also see that the S21 and S12 are symmetric. And you have about maybe 8 or 9 dB of loss between the two of them. Yes, that it takes into account the coupler and everything else that's there. So any signal that is injected in the in from the internal port of the network analyzer arrives to the port 1 on the outside with about 8 dB down of power. But why do these not match? Well, this actually tells us something really important about the property of this coupler. It basically tells us that in this coupler, we have very good isolation between this port and this port, because the unterminated port here causes the return loss of this port to be bad, but not of this one. And we can observe this by actually putting the attenuator back and keeping an eye on this return loss over here. So I'm going to go ahead, take this, and attach it here, and take a look. You can see that the S11 is not affected at all, while S22 is, gets significantly better. This is exactly what you want from a coupler like this in a network analyzer, because it means that the forward signal reaches this port, but the reflected signal goes all the way over here. And anything from here to here is fully isolated, and anything injected from here to here is fully isolated. That's an ideal coupler for this situation. We can demonstrate that even further by removing this and connecting it over here, or removing this and connecting it over here. That tells us the relationship between these two ports and these two ports. So let's give that a try. So now let's take a look at this condition. We have port 1 connected here, and port 2 connected here, and the front port of this coupler is actually unterminated. Now if I look at the S parameters, what do you see? Well, we actually see only about 14 dB of loss between the two ports. So what's going on? I thought this was supposed to be fully isolated. Well, let's think about the situation here. The signal that's injected from this side comes over here, sees an open circuit, there's a perfect reflection. The reflection comes back over here and goes through here. 
So we are seeing this loss plus this loss, and that's what the S12 is. And the signal injected from here finds its way to here, bounces back, and then reaches back onto this side. So therefore, we have no isolation from here to here under the condition where this is unterminated. That's actually part of how S parameter measurements work. But let's take a look and see what happens when I add that termination. So I'm just going to take the same termination. I'm going to add it to the front and take a look and see what happens to, S to S12 and S21. Look at that. They go all the way down, as good as that load is that I'm adding. So indeed, there is very good isolation between those two ports. These are now around minus 40 dB, which is quite a bit of a difference. So we basically now have a full information about how this works. The only condition we haven't measured is the condition between these two ports directly. So we can see the coupling between the two of them, and I'm going to do that now. And here's the final condition, and let's take a look at the result. Looking good. Let's see what we have. There we go. You can see S11 and S22 are well matched because I terminated the unopened port, and the S12 and S21 is about minus 6 dB. So we got a 6 dB coupler between those two ports, giving us really, really good dynamic range on this network analyzer under um, all kind of conditions. So this is a good component. We're going to keep it. It's very large, of course, but it's still very useful for if you want to do some high dynamic ra range measurement, you want an excellent coupler. So here's our quad mixer module. I've taken the heat sink off so we can see the voltage to an oscillator here, which is driven with a high amplitude into what I think is a step recovery diode for pulse generation. And it generates four pulses simultaneously into these four modules. I've taken the screws off of this one just so we can take a look and see how they put it together because the assembly of this is fairly interesting. It has to be done in a sequence so that you can put things together. It's a combination of low frequency things on the IF and bias and very high frequency things like the pulse and the RF that goes into this port. So if I were to remove that, it should come off. There we go. I think I took all the screws off and <laughs> there you go. So you can see what a clever way this is done. We have the a lot of the pulses going in into this RF going into here, and this is just a sampler. And it produces two outputs, which are also used for biasing. And the IF comes out of these after the down conversion, essentially. And then they connect through the back of this board. And you can see there's two pieces of cl there are two clips here, which these two pins slide down. And they slide in between them. And that's how the connection is made. So you can assemble this like that, and a good ground connection with these spring-loaded connectors at the edges, and everything else is just IF amplification. There are some tuners and everything on the inside, but yeah, the assembly of this is pretty straightforward as a result of this. You can put it back together without disturbing this very sensitive and high-frequency part, and we could always open these later on, take a look at them, and see the diodes and the various VTO functions. I'm interested in seeing what's in here more than this, because it's probably just going to be one little component. Yeah, looks really good. I think if you let me know in the comment section if this is something that you want me to take apart a little bit further, I can try and do that. Let me see if I can put this back together right now. It should slide right back in. There we go. Yeah, so I think this is still probably functional. Uh, obviously, I haven't tested it, but you know, we're going to keep it for future uses. And there you have it. We got lots of interesting parts and some really cool measurements. I forgot to mention I also got these uh, edge connectors. These are 26.5 gigahertz edge to um, chassis mountable connectors, which are very good if you're repairing an instrument or something like that. These can be quite expensive to replace as they are, and there are five of them in this unit alone. And yeah, I hope you like this video. If you like this type of video, let me know in the comment section. I do often take equipment apart that are not really repairable, and I extract components for them, and you often see them in some of the experiments we do actually in some of the other videos. And I hope you like this. I'll see you next time.